you're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI Show. We talk all about fine tuning with Alicia Frame. Make sure you tune in. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the AI Show. We're talking all about fine tuning to fine or not to fine tune. That is the question with Alicia Frame. How you doing, my friend? Why don't you tell us who you are and what you do? I'm good. I'm Alicia Frame. I'm the product manager for Azure Open AI Service, uh, looking after fine tuning. So all day, every day, fine tuning. That is amazing. So listen, I, I get this question all the time, but I thought we'd go through each little step so folks get a clear understanding of what it is and maybe how to do it. But let's just start off with what is fine tuning as compared to other things? So fine tuning is a way of customizing a large language model. Uh, but there are other ways. And I think this is kind of where people sometimes get confused. And the way that I think of it as you know, your fine tuning is one way to customize. If you want to add your data, there's kind of two tracks. One is adding information into your prompt, which is information that you're giving to the model to answer a question. The other track is changing the model itself. And so RAG, prompt engineering, retrieval-based techniques, those all mess with your prompt. Fine tuning is actually retraining the model, changing the weights of the model to make it perform differently, to teach it a new skill, to teach it new information, to change how it acts. I see. So so when when we say add your data to to actually do LM, it's a little confusing because for some reason, a lot of people are saying that, are, is that training, adding different weights to the model? And so that's not the case. You're doing a prompt thing, but you can also do a fine tuning thing. It, did I get that right? Yeah, I think I think like the brand name add your data can be a little confusing for folks because in that case, what we're talking about is adding your data to the prompt. Got it. Fine tuning is adding your data to the model and it, it operates differently. It has different outcomes. So two different tracks, both customize your model. And in the end, you probably need both of them together. Oh, interesting. So here's a question, though, because I, I have been going around, and if I'm wrong, you throw the flag at me. I've been going around saying that for the majority of use cases, it's probably enough to fix your prompt and then send it to the LLM. So the question that I have for you is, when it is, it, is it appropriate to use fine tuning? And is that statement that I made correct? Your statement is usually correct. Okay. So like most of the time, you can get what you need with prompt engineering. You can add more information into your prompt. You can add few shot examples and get the outcome you want. And no matter what, I would always recommend you want to start with prompt engineering because you want to know how far you can get with the base model with prompt engineering. So you know if fine tuning is actually making it any better or not kind of when fine tuning comes in and when you make the choice of like, oh, I really do need to fine tune here is kind of two different areas. One is you need to teach the model a new skill. So it you want the model to just do one thing, but do it really, really well. And it's not really able to do it without a lot of guidance or you wanna kind of change the behavior of the model. And I'll show this in a demo. Okay. Um, the other case when you might choose to fine tune is if you want to lower your latency, use a cheaper model, where you want to switch out one model for another. So instead of GPT-4, use fine-tuned 3.5 Turbo. Or, hey, you've written a beautiful prompt, but it's really, really long. It's causing a lot of latency. And you want to move a lot of those instructions directly into the model, reduce latency, reduce inference costs. That's another use case for fine-tuning. I see. So it feels like if you want to, if you want to, because these models are super general. But if you want to narrow the scope of the model a little bit, if that's kind of like, usually that there's like a smell, a code smell when I was a dev, that's what I, <laughs> is that a good smell to be like, if I want to narrow it or is it, am yeah. I off with it? No, that's like a really good example of like, so GPT-4 does a lot of things super, super well, but maybe all I need is a model that classifies things according to my rules quickly and at a low cost. And GPT-4 is overkill for that. I can train Turbo using a fine tuning data set to just do that one thing and do it well. So kind of that go from broad generalist model to single skill is a really good like, ah, maybe fine tuning for this one. Got it. And the other thing you said is that if you find that your prompt is overflowing a little bit, because I mean, 
like there's only a certain amount of space in the prompts, that's another good indication that maybe there it's appropriate to fine tune. Yeah, sometimes you'll hear people talk about fine tuning and they'll say fine tune when you want to show not tell the model what to do. And so this is like you have a lot of edge cases, a lot of examples, and you're starting with prompt engineering and you like add example one and you're like, ah, not quite add example two, mm, still not there. And you keep adding and then you run out of space. There's there's too many edge cases, too many behaviors where you're trying to show the model what to do. And that's a good like, oh, fine tuning, move those instructions into the model. So you see that a lot with like uh, natural language to SQL use cases or like classic example is like teaching the model to play chess. It's kind of these, I can give you a thousand examples of what I want you to do, but I have trouble verbalizing that in, you know, a few hundred characters. That makes sense. And so, so let's talk a little bit about how it's done because like I'm a, I'm kind of a data scientist, not as much as you. But my sense is that these models are so big. Are you fine tuning the entire model? No. Or what is it that's actually going on? Uh, so people get a sense for that. So we do not offer full fine tuning. There are a lot, one, there's a, when we say fine tuning, fine tuning means a lot of different things. Right. Uh, what we offer on Azure OpenAI is supervised fine tuning. Um, and the way we go about that is uh, LoRa or low rank approximation. And so with LoRa fine tuning, you're really only adjusting a very small subset of the weights for your use case. You're not going in and retraining the model from scratch. This makes it a lot more cost efficient, a lot easier to deploy, um, lots of optimizations involved in doing that. I see. So you're you're basically optimizing a subset of the internal model weights with your particular data that way it learns new pathways etc and, and that's what's going on yeah and i think that goes back to there's many types of fine tuning supervised fine tuning is kind of example based so you you provide the model with like here's the input and here's the output i expect and you provide it you know hundreds hopefully thousands of examples of that and that's how you train the model fully supervised other techniques you know continual pre-training RLHF operate differently, but for this, it's very much around teaching the model to do one thing well. So, and now this is, I remember when I was doing my, my, my research, you know, in computational linguistics, there was this, there was this theory called pack learning theory that taught us how many examples we needed to give the model for it to be successful. Is there something like, is my sense is that that's not <laughs> the case for these models. No. So the rule of thumb, one is the pipeline will fail if you have fewer than 10 examples. Yeah, uh, it'll just error out. That does not mean 10 is enough. 10 is not enough. Um, my experience is like, more is always better. The more sophisticated the model, the fewer examples you tend to need. So like, I have fine tuned GPT-4 versus 3.5 Turbo versus Babbage and DaVinci. Mm -hmm. Uh, small, smarter model, fewer examples, uh, complexity of the ta task at hand also requires kind of different numbers of examples, but there's no like, ah, you want to teach it NL to SQL that requires 257 examples for 3.5 Turbo. You're basically what you're going to do is get together a good sized data set, fine tune, evaluate and iterate. And I have a demo later on where I'll show you kind of fine tuning two different models to do the same thing. Um, but one of those models takes a lot more data to get something vaguely plausible than the other. Okay, and then the last question before we go to like, can you show us what how it works? When when the model is fine tuned, I, I work with a lot of enterprises uh, um, and I talk to like their risk people and their other people. When, when folks are fine tuning the model, is it fine tuning like, an aggregate model that everyone has access to, or is it like completely private to the user? And I, I probably, I think I know the answer to this, but I want to let you weigh in on it. Private to the user. So okay. when you fine tune your model, it is all in your own secure workspace. We don't have access to your data, to your weights, to any of that. Um, when you finish fine tuning, what you get is basically the new weights for inferencing using your customized model, using your data. And when you deploy that, what you're deploying are your new weights. So you have your own custom custom model that is in its own secure environment. It's isolated. You're not 
you're not like sharing your secret sauce with everybody else. Yeah, that makes sense. And then the, I, I, I thought I was alive, but then the other one just came into my head. I, I've been telling folks that content safety is built in into all Azure open AI things and that traps, you know, things coming in and going out to make sure that it's blocking things that are sensitive across five different areas. Is that still the case when, once you fine tune the model, can you tell us about that? It's super important for fine tuning. So yeah. it's definitely still the case. One of the risks that you've probably heard about if you've like Googled fine tuning, read articles about it, is a lot of people are concerned that fine tuning can inadvertently fine tune out safety or a bad actor could fine tune a, a model to be evil. And we don't we don't want to help people do that. We don't want right. to condone that. Uh, so content safety is applied, you know, to all of the outputs from your model. You have the same moderation to make sure that nothing is unsafe or harmful and that you're only getting the good stuff. Awesome. Well, I thought now that you've given us all the details, can you show us how this is done? People can get a sense for what the data looks like, what the process looks like. Yep. Let me share my screen. So here you see Azure OpenAI Studio. This is a super simple UI for interacting with everything we offer on Azure OpenAI. It's also possible to do fine tuning via the REST API or the Python SDK. It's just not as interesting to watch for a demo. Right. Um, so what I'm gonna walk through is just fine tuning kind of cooking show demo style. Uh, so I wanna fine tune, I go to models. And you do have to be in a region that supports fine tuning. So North Central US and Sweden Central. Okay. Uh, fine tuning a model is actually super easy. So all I do is I click create a custom model. I choose the base model that I want. And for this, I'm gonna choose 3.5 Turbo. So there's three models you can fine tune. Uh, Babbage and DaVinci are completion models, simple models, uh, low cost options, uh, not as capable. And then Turbo is a chat model. Uh, this is a more general purpose model, more sophisticated. You do have to provide chat format data. But for this, I'm going to just choose Turbo. I'm going to call it Cool Demo. Nice. Um, great names. Next thing I do is I'm going to choose a data set. You can upload a data set. I happen to have a bunch of stuff already loaded. Uh, so I'm going to choose a data set, emoji training. I will talk through what I'm actually doing once we kick off running. Uh, so choose a training data set, choose a validation data set. This is actually optional. You don't have to provide it, but it makes it much easier to tell if fine tuning made the model better or worse. Uh, advanced options. This is kind of if you want to put your data science hat on. Uh, right now, you can just change the number of epochs, which is basically how long will it take for me to fine tune my model? Um, how many passes over the data do I do? I don't want to change that. Uh, so then I can review. I see base model training validation file and actually kicking off training is as simple as start training job. So, so before you go, we keep going. I, I thought I'd ask a couple of questions. If you see me looking at the side, I'm looking at the screen here. So uh, there was a couple of different model options. Is there is it written down anywhere when you should w use which? So it's written down in our docs. Uh, the kind of rule of thumb is Babbage and DaVinci are completion models. So like given a phrase, what's the next phrase? What's the next word? Turbo is a chat model. So it's a conversational interaction. So I could say, you know, hey, how, what did you think of the demo? And it would respond with an answer instead of the next most likely word. I see. And so it's it's the use case uh, that, that makes a difference. But what about the size? Are, are the sizes equivalent? I know we don't know much about some of the models, but are the sizes the same? Does that really change what you, you decide to do? So Babbage and DaVinci are GPT-3 based models. Uh, if folks have fine-tuned with us before, we used to offer Ada, Babbage, Curie, and DaVinci 01 as fine-tunable models, simple GPT-3 based completion models. Now we offer Babbage 002 and DaVinci 002, next generation of the same models. They are smaller. We don't say exactly how big they are, but they are smaller models relative to Turbo. And the next question I have is uh, regarding the data. What does the data look like? This is where I said I was going to explain what I'm actually doing with fine tuning. Okay. So for this example, what I'm doing is we talked about I want to teach the model a new skill. And so the skill I want to teach my model, and we can argue if this is a skill or not, 
is to only respond to my input with an appropriate emoji formatted as it would be formatted in Teams. So if we take a look at this, you've got kind of an example data set for a uh, turbo model. So this is chat formatted. So what you have is you have the input, uh, the system message. So you're a chat bot, you only respond with emojis. And then I have my input message of, I just passed my driving test. And then what I would consider the appropriate emoji response, in this case, it's party. And it's formatted in the like parentheses emoji name, because that's kind of how Microsoft recognizes emojis in Teams. And that's how got I generated it. my data set. And for this, what you can see is I've got, I think this example might, this file might have 600 examples, but they're all formatted as uh, prompt and response. I see. And and it's it's actually in the same format uh, that you would, like it's the same thing you would post to the service effectively. Exactly. It's exactly the same. And then, so if you look at like uh, the same file formatted for a model like Babbage or DaVinci, this probably looks familiar to you in terms of prompt completion format, right? You yeah. have prompt and then you complete it with this emoji um, and you do need a stop character. That's amazing. Uh, it's actually simpler than I had envisioned. <laughs> uh, but but I, people keep telling me that this stuff is harder than it is, but this is really simple. So why is it hard to do this if it's this easy to set up? So it's, it's deceptively easy to set up. Okay. Where it gets hard is uh, if you mess up your data, you will still get a fine tuned model. It'll just be terrible. So when we go back to kind of the cooking show and we look at the models that have been fine tuned, I have an example where I took, I took my fine tuning training set, right? Where we have the appropriate response. You know, I passed my driving test party and I basically knocked up, knocked the responses off by one. So the responses, no longer make a ton of sense. So we have, I passed my driving test and what is the response? It is poop. Um, <laughs> Oops. <laughs> we can still, we can still fine tune a model with this. We'll still get an output, but you'll see bad data in equals bad fine tuned model. Uh, so I see. It's not like the act of fine tuning itself is hard. What's hard is getting the right data to make the model better and not worse. Awesome. So can we go to the baking show? Because obviously when you're getting to this other uh, part and, and you're going to bring up your screen, another question I have here is how long does this take? Because my sense is that it would be a pretty boring show if we said start fine tuning and we all just put like elevator music on. Yeah, we're not going to sit here and watch it. So we can see what we see here is I have all, this is the job I kicked off before. It's pending. We can check on it and see what it's doing. Training started. But it's probably going to be I don't know, an hour, an hour and a half until that one finishes. So that would be really boring. Um, we can take a look at one that I did earlier. And so when your job is finished, you'll see succeeded. And we can click on it. And you'll get some metrics about how did fine tuning go. So we can see over time, training loss went down. I can see training token accuracy. This one takes a while to plot sometimes. Mm -hmm. Let's switch to loss. You can get some basic statistics about how did it go. And then I can see, okay, this took one and a quarter hours to train. So this is the example data set we were just looking at. Um, and I can see kind of all the different steps. It had to retry a couple times, um, but then it finished and then my model was available. And so if I want to go check out my model, I just go over to deployments. And you can see these are all the models that I have fine tuned and some base models that I already deployed. I just click create a new deployment and creating a new deployment basically makes that model available to inference against. I see. Uh, I choose a model. And so I've got my base models at the top and then at the bottom, all the fine tuned models I've already set up show up. So I'm going to choose one that I don't already have deployed. Um, and then I can call it demo deployment. And what will happen is assuming I haven't run out of quota, you'll see it under the deployment list and eventually it'll deploy. This usually takes about five, 10 minutes to be deployed. And then once it's deployed, we can go interact with that model and kind of 
see how it responds. And you can interact with a model in the playground just like you would any other model. Yep, just like you would with the base model. That's awesome. Cool. Okay, so in my mind, if I want to distill down the process, uh, the first thing is, and I know I want to see you play with it too. The first thing is you got to gather some data. It's got to be appropriately shaped for the type of model, whether completion or chat. Once you start to fine tuning job, you got to wait for an hour or wherever, however long your data set is. You've got to look at metrics, make sure it's done the right thing, because if it's diverging on the loss, then we have a problem. You don't want to use that model. And then you have to deploy that model as a last step. Is that, did I get that right? Yep. And then maybe one step after of okay. now you've deployed your model. Now let's, now let's talk to the model and see if it's, see if it's better or worse. Let's do it. Okay. So this is a deployment I set up earlier. And if any of you have used AI Studio before, this is kind of what it looks like. I've got my assistant set up on the side. I've got my chat session and I've got my configuration where I can toggle between different base models. And so what I have here is I have Turbo, which is just the off the shelf, unfine tuned model. I have my fine tuned emoji chatbot model, which we have fine tuned to respond with an appropriate emoji. And then we have our bad emoji bot, where we've chosen a dubious data set to find. Nice. So let's start with Turbo. And this is the system message that was in the fine tuning data set. You're a chatbot, you only respond with emojis. And this is what it does with kind of no guidance whatsoever. And you can see this is not the format I want, um, but it does respond to emojis. So how do you feel? about fine tuning. I don't oh, know what that means, but this is how Turbo feels about it. So this is the base model. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch to the fine tuned model with the data set that we just looked at. So this is emoji chatbot. Um, I'm gonna cut down the number of messages in the past that are included. And we have the same system message as before. So that's important. If you don't have the system message used in fine tuning, you won't get your expected response. But now let's all cross our fingers because this is live and see how it responds. Voila, it is nice. responding in my appropriately formatted, mass formatted message. I've changed the behavior of the model, right? It now knows to respond in a different way and it is responding mostly appropriately. So let's try. How do you feel about fine tuning? Okay. <laughs> nice. It feels a little bit about it. Fine. Yeah. Okay. So it is responding in the right format, but these could be better responses. So let's try the bad emoji bot. And this one has been trained with garbled data. So you could say, you know, this generally makes sense. So, you know, if I say hello, it says wave. Cool. Let's go to bad emoji bot. And this one, let's see, let's try hello again. Thank you. <laughs> oh man, that's awesome. And so this is like, the data look fine, right? But now it's, it's pretty garbled. Are you okay? This is not a good model, right? What, what, what might that mean? So we, yeah. we garbled our data set. We've made the model worse. So it's it's pretty easy to accidentally make your model worse. I see. And and it may even be a situation. And now I understand why the last step is to actually try it out. <laughs> it may even be that the last step, uh, if you if you don't do the last step, which is test it, that your loss will lo look good. Your validation loss will look good, but it's still not the right thing. So I think we can probably actually go in and look at the evaluation on this model. Let's and do it. Let's see. The only problem is it's a little. Okay, so here's bad emoji bot. This looks fine. Like, yeah. There's nothing, nothing that makes me say, like, oh, something has gone horribly wrong here. You know, this looks fine. It's only when you go to talk to the model and it just says boop uh, that you're like, oh no, something has gone wrong. Well, this is awesome, Alicia. We, we're kind of almost out of time. Where can people go to find out more? Uh, so I think I shared some links ahead of time. Let me stop mm -hmm. sharing my screen. 
Uh, the easiest place to go is in our docs. Uh, we have a tutorial and a how-to guide that show you how to get started with some nice, like easy to follow examples. They are toy examples. So 10 example examples, it shows you the process. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got a blog outlining it and really just get, get your hands dirty and find out how it works. That's amazing. So I put the links below. I, I short linked them uh, for us. So they can be the tutorial you can find here. Uh, make sure you go take a look at that. And then the blog is here also. Uh, for If you're interested in the Azure OpenAI service, there you can you can go take a look at that right here. And then finally, if you want to sign up, you can do that here. Well, anything else that you want to add to finish up? So the one thing that I didn't show, but I do have a demo of, is you can also fine tune a smaller model mm -hmm. uh, to have the same behavior as the bigger model. So the oh. demo I showed was using Turbo it's an expensive model to fine tune, expensive to deploy, comparatively expensive for inference. With a sufficient data set, I can actually fine tune Babbage or DaVinci to have that same behavior of just do one thing really well. And all it'll respond with is your kind of completion emoji. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's that idea of if you take a less sophisticated model, but it only does one thing, totally feasible and a great use case for fine tuning. Well, that's awesome. We should it, hopefully that's in the is that in the blog that people can take a look at. It's not, but I should write a separate blog about it. Uh, we'll make sure to point that. And if not, we can have you back on and we can take a look at that in more detail because this is awesome. Thank you so much for spending some time with us, Alicia. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much for watching, my friends. We're learning all about fine tuning to fine tune or not to fine tune. That is the question here on the AI Show. Thank you so much for watching, and hopefully, we'll see you next time. Take care.